for coming in to this and listening and discussing with Barbara Foley on race, class, and intersectionality. And um, you know, uh, you might have seen she's distinguished professor at Rutgers, uh, Newark. And before I go on, I just wanted to uh, at least acknowledge the uh, land we are on. The uh, meeting is the territory of the uh, Huron Wendat and the Petun First Nations, Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And the territory was involved in an agreement between the Iroquois and Confederacy, the Confederacy, the Ojibwe, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources of the Great Lakes. So I want to first thank the Department of Politics, uh, which we are in the midst of uh, spatially here, for sponsoring uh, this event and giving us an opportunity uh, to come together to speak about this crucial set of issues. And also, uh, there's been some co-sponsorship uh, from the newly founded program on Marxist studies and global and Asian perspective, which we call MISGAP for short. Uh, and that's part of the York Center for Asian Research, or some people know it as YCAR. Anyway, um, so, be, yeah, yeah, so, be, yeah, 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 it is. Um, uh, Barbara Foley, I think, is ideally suited um, to address the, the thorny and sometimes contentious problems that, you know, associated with, you know, complex forms and registers of oppression. Uh, under and within capitalism from race and class, gender, sexuality, and, and most importantly, I think uh, her work on radicalness uh, offers insight as to how we m move out from such oppressions uh, into different organized, uh, just and equal social political world. And her approach to this set of topics and debates um, is coming, coming at them from the starting point of a political economy anchored humanities and it has the advantage of offering a, a unique grasp on subjectivity, agency, interpretation within the context of the penetrating analysis of power within contemporary capitalism. So a, a sort of worthy pathway, as I see it, you know, Raymond Williams has certainly, you know, forged and Frederick Jameson as well. So I see it along the sort of trajectory. And, and central to Professor Foley's uh, work is the concern with ideologies, of cultures operating within the material forms and structures of capitalism with special attention uh, to the relationship between race and anti-capitalism, especially as it bears on revolutionary imaginaries. So um, here, her works are, are many, and they include uh, radical representations, politics and form in US proletarian fiction, 1929 to 41, Specters of 1919, Class and Nation in the Making of the New Negro, which offered a particularly important understanding of the radical sinews of the uh, Harlem Renaissance. And there was you know, wrestling with the left, making, uh, the making of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, which was published by Duke, and then uh, Jean Tamar, uh, Race, Repression, Revolution, a book about the Harlem Renaissance uh, poet who wrote uh, about both racial and class oppressions. And, and most recently, she just published with Pluto Press, uh, Marxist Literary Criticism Today. And there are some flyers on the desk there, if you want to see that, uh, the paper. I've got a couple up here. And it's online, it's Pl Pluto Press, uh, just, just came out. And, uh, and some of you may be interested in Barbara's also recently published essay on racism in the Bloom Bloomsbury Companion uh, to Marx, uh, a volume with many essays in there over various topics, right? And some of you are familiar with the Bloomsbury efforts. So uh, Professor Foley has just has, has not just been an academic person, but a political person, right? Uh, and for many decades, she's been involved in advancing critical and radical politics off and on campuses and within important academic profession, professional organizations like the MLA. And she's done much to try, at least, to even up the score a bit against those who use the university and the academy uh, from the president offices on down to propagate neoliberal, racial, and neocolonial power, right? Somehow it's always okay, you know, for them to advance those corporate <laughs> and state interests, right? But not for us to try to advance the interests of, of their victims. So it's typical for the sort of event, uh, we'll hear Barbara speak for about uh, 50 minutes or so, and then open up discussion uh, with all of us in a sort of Q&A style, and uh, I'll turn the floor to Barbara now, please. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's always funny to hear your work talked about through somebody else's lingo. So thank you. <laughs> but you got it. You got it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Robert Latham, obviously. Um, by the way, we, we went back and forth about six times about the number of nouns to be included in this discussion here. And we've, I've, I've, shed it a few, I've shed a few along the way. But race, class, intersectionality, identity, and Marxism have all made it 
<laughs> right up there, and there are a few more you mentioned down below, which we'll, we'll, we'll be touching on. So thank you very much, Robert. Um, my, my, the, the contact of, 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 of greatest length here at, at York for me has been Raju Das, whom I know from the uh, Manuscript Collective and Editorial Collective of Science and Society, a Marxist journal, and I value his collegial nature and activity very much. Um, I want to uh, thank Carolyn Cross and Margot Barreto for facilitating my visit here, the Department of Political Science and MISGAP, if I got that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then finally, I just want to give a shout out to Gokburo Sarp Tanyildiz, if I said that correctly, or more or less, okay, who at a crucial point when I was trying to find out, oh, what, are, what, are what are grad students talking about here at York these days? He sent me a, a very, very useful set of readings, which I have actually, you know, looked at quite carefully in preparing for this talk. Can you all hear me back there? Okay, okay, all right. All right, here we go. And I will go on for a while, and I'll try not to just tear through this, so, you know, I'll, I'll map where the talk is going, so you'll have some, some, some sense of where we are. So, <clears throat> what's at stake in current discussions of intersectionality, of race and class, of identity, and Marxism? Well, quite a lot. If we believe, to put a kind of spin on Marx's 11th thesis on Farbach, if we, if we believe that we need to interpret the world accurately or as accurately as possible in order to try to change it. In some ways, we are well positioned to undertake this project of combining theory and practice. A recent Harris poll, I got this information from Raju, indicates that in the U.S., 61% of people between 18 and 24 view socialism in a favorable light. A Gallup poll last year found that 51% of Americans, that term being used for the United States, I believe, between 18 and 29 view socialism positively, while less than half of the same age found capitalism agreeable, whatever that means exactly. I don't know what the stats are for Canada. I suspect probably more favorable than they, than they are in the U.S. Okay, um, since the financial crisis of 2008, Capitalism is no longer as invisible as the air we breathe. It's seen as a social order, or if you choose disorder, that came into being in history and that can go out of being in history. Moreover, capitalism is not just neoliberalism or corporatization, but a system of class rule. It's a hydra with many heads that feed the same rapacious body. If, moreover, we grasp capitalism's multiple mediations through politics and culture, we see that it has spawned a range of domestic and international movements of resistance. And I would spread this out to say not only the Occupy movement, but also the Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter. And since 2012, the rhetorical opposition between the 1% and the 99%, indeed now as the quarter of 1% versus the 99 and 3 quarters of a percent, has become common currency. For those of us, of us inhabiting the groves of academe, this sharpened awareness of capital's leakage into all zones of thought and belief enables us to look back on the intellectual trends of the period between the 1980s and the late 2000s, preeminently, though not exclusively, the period dominated by post-structuralism and post-modernism. We can see it as a long detour through theory that reflected, in some ways, the exhaustion of a, of a class-based politics in the face of an onslaught by capital in its neoliberal form. I gather Ellen Mason's Wood used to pace these halls, and I'm thinking here of her concept of the retreat from class. The emergence of what has come to be called identity politics can be seen, at least in part, as a symptomatic response to these developments. The base superstructure paradigm inevitably comes to mind. The fetishization of the local and the marginal, the allergy to master narratives, the fear of categories as analytical tools, the insistence on the linguistic construction of reality, the enshrinement of epistemological relativism. All these features of dominant ideological paradigms now invite interpretation as having been or as being ideologically coded. And while Derrida and Foucault can surely not be blamed for the 8,158 lies uttered by Donald Trump in the, his first two years in office, the potentially toxic implications of the linguistic construction of reality have somewhat more recently come home to roost, if you'll pardon the mixed metaphor, in the cavalier treatment of fake news or even faker charges of fakeness in public discourse. In this bizarre epistemological universe, the alternative facts of a Donald Trump are just the tip of the proto-fascist iceberg. Again, mixed metaphor. Even, yet, yet even as a hunger for old-fashioned truth, which is no longer in quotation marks, has re-emerged, the pundits who lambaste the right for its patent distortions of reality are busy entertaining us with new versions of the facts, as with current happenings in Venezuela, 
or regarding the integrity and reliability of the FBI and CIA, who now are just, you know, nothing about them smells bad anymore, so it seems, in the United States. Anyhow, these lies it's, that serve more mainstream ruling class interests, so it's hard to, to stay on top of things and who's telling the biggest lies. It's always relatively easy to perform symptomatic readings of the past. Feeling enabled by dialectical negation, we can sort of see this, uh, heave a sigh of relief at being no longer entrapped within a Gramscian common sense that coerces us unknowingly into consent. It's much harder, though, to, for, to view the common sense of the present through appropriately self-critical lenses. Dialectical negation does not, after all, mean the disappearance of what was formerly hegemonic. Sublation carries over many aspects of the old into what is new or what feels like is new. We should therefore not be too self-congratulatory about our newfound compass in the road towards social justice. In my remarks today, which I hope largely reflect some of the optimism of which I've just been speaking, I'm also going to touch upon some of the blind spots that, in my view, continue to inhibit a materialist understanding of what is to be done. First, and somewhat obviously, what's, what's meant by socialism in its recent rise in popularity is clearly up for grabs. While leftists should not, indeed cannot, look this gift horse in the mouth, it's much easier these days to talk about the S word and the C word than it was 15 or 20 years ago, take my word for it. Nonetheless, the current prestige of the socialist alternative is clearly an ideological grab bag containing everything from a modest extension of the welfare state to somewhat more dramatic proposals for popular empowerment. Yet, while they frequently pay lip service to vague notions of global solidarity, the currently prevailing notions of socialism, whether uttered by the DSA, proponents of single-payer health care, or advocates of a minimum basic income, remain constrained within the bounds of the nation state. Proletarian internationalism seems not to be on the agenda, at least not yet. In addition, reflected in many current discussions of class, race, and identity, as we'll see in a moment, there's an abiding anti-Marxism, indeed, I'd say, anti-communism, that conflates class analysis with class reductionism, mechanistic base superstructure logic, and economic determinism. Marxism thus takes shape from this standpoint as a doctrine in need of supplementation by other discourses, cultural and psychological, that it presumably dismisses otherwise as epiphenomenal. Even if the, if the postmodernist distrust of master narratives has fallen into some disrepute then, this suspicion of Marxism's claim to expan explanatory power remains alive and well in certain abiding characterizations of Marxism as complicit in the project of Enlightenment rationalism and therefore being part of the problem rather than the solution. Even as capitalism is often viewed these, days, viewed these days as the root of all evil, this does not mean that ideologies supporting the capitalist world order have lost all that much influence. I'll begin my talk today with a defense of the necessity for Marxist class analysis in current discussions of intersectionality and identity. I'll follow this with a critical discussion of some terms widely used these days to analyze the well-worn terrain of race and class, namely anti-blackness, racial capitalism, and white privilege. I'll close with some observations about the necessity for communism, both as a baseline ethics for analyzing the nature of inequality in the present and as the future orientation of any serious movement for social justice. Underlying these three general topics will be four overlapping methodological premises. First, a defense of universals, to reject the false universals of Eurocentricity and other ideologically saturated paradigms is not to reject the notion of totality. Indeed, this defense of universals requires that we embrace the proposition central to the philosophy of moral realism that there exist objective and universal human needs, both of the stomach and the imagination, as Marx put it on the very first page of Das Kapital. Understanding the universality of these needs is essential to both the theory and practice of social justice, which otherwise remains a shallow and sentimental homily. A second methodological premise entails a critique of collapsing epistemology into ontology, too often resulting in a doctrine of incommensurability that reifies the standpoints of different social groups, re-enshrines essentialism, and negates the possibility for materially based solidarity. Third, my arguments here are premised upon a robust defense of the notion of ideology, not only as structurally blinkered on misunderstanding, but also as false consciousness, greatly out of fashion as that concept may be. One cannot maintain that some universals supply more adequate maps of social reality than others without conceding that people who reject the better universals for whatever reason 
are in whole or in part just plain wrong, and may often be shooting themselves in the foot by betraying their own objective interests. Finally, the claim at the core of these methodological premises is that they are best enacted by, get this phrase, and I have a nice long phrase here, an anti-racist, anti-sexist, internationalist, multiply mediated, non-economic determinist Marxism. All right? This Marxism is open to all kinds of extensions and self-criticisms, but it remains anchored in dialectical and historical materialism. Within its limits, this Marxism not only offers the best, if by no means a perfect, framework for analysis, but also in connecting theory to practice supplies the best set of strategic mediations, such as multiracial unity in the fight against racism, for getting from the here of capitalism to the there of post-capitalist egalitarianism, whatever you want to call it. A lot has been and continues to be written about intersectionality, identity, and Marxism. While theorists of different stripes are evincing a willingness to listen to one another respectfully, as well as participate in the project of extending basic Marxist principles in ways suited to present political needs, I see some problems in recent attempts to yoke Marxism with internationality, as intersectionality, sorry. <laughs> I'll mention three of these. First of all, Sharon Smith, in a 2017 paper titled A Marxist Case for Intersectionality, she expands upon her earlier 2013-2014 writing uh, on the subject by usefully here drawing attention to the need to distinguish between the post-structuralist approach to intersectionality premised upon the autonomization of spheres of struggle, that's a phrase she takes from uh, Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe, a uh, difference between that one and the more materialist version based in black feminism that stressed, quote, the simultaneity of oppression, Barbara Smith's phrase, and the matrix of domination. Patricia L. Collins' phrase. Sharon Smith links this latter tradition to the formulations of the triple oppression of black women offered by the U.S. communists Claudia Jones and Angela Davis, and especially to the commitment to anti-capitalism anti voiced in 1977 by the black lesbian feminists in the Cumbie River Collective, who originated the phrase in anti anti identity politics. The foundation of this strand of intersectionality in black feminism, Smith concludes, makes it not just compatible with, but a necessary supplement to, a capacious Marxism able to confront the challenges of present day gender and race based political concerns. Okay, in the 2017 paper, Smith maintains her earlier differentiation between oppression and exploitation, and I'm hopeful that at least some people in here are familiar with her work, it's, it's important, and her claims that class analysis is, is uniquely capable of supplying a structural account of the connections between the two. So far, so good. She now, she, she now further asserts, however, that, here I'm quoting, because intersectionality is a concept, a, a description of the experience of multiple oppressions without explaining their causes, rather than a theory, which does attempt to explain the root causes of oppressions, it, intersectionality, can therefore be placed alongside different theories of oppression, a theories informed by Marxism or postmodernism, but also separatism. This last assertion gives one pause. If the descriptive power of intersectionality can be as fully deployed by separatism or postmodernism as by Marxism, what does this say about the premises guiding the epistemological standpoint encoded in what she is calling black feminism? Can the categories of black and woman, as well as, quote, the experience of multiple oppressions, can they implicitly signify, or, or that, wait, can, can the categories that, that black woman, as well as experience of multiple oppressions that, that they implicitly signify, can these ever be merely descriptive? Sorry about that. Don't they inevitably ask to be unpacked by Marxists in ways very different from the ways postmodernists or separatists would understand them? Marxists, Eve Mitchell, an important theorist in this, in this zone, has suggested would insist upon historicizing these terms as products of gendered and racialized divisions of labor derived from the types of exploitation characteristic of different modes of production. But when used as neutral descriptors, Mitchell warns, these terms end up reifying the historical processes from which they emerged. The separatists whom Smith cites, by contrast, and she doesn't name anybody in particular, would presumably ontologize the categories of black and woman as constituting a subject position fundamentally incommensurable with the ways in which Marxists would understand these categories' political implications. Therefore, in this 2017 piece called the, the Marxist Case for Intersectionality, what looks like a flexible and non-dogmatic attempt to accommodate ident identity politics to class analysis and vice versa 
ends up merely blurring important theoretical distinctions between standpoint theory and Marxism without pointing the way toward a more coherent practice. And I have, if people want to talk about standpoint theory later on, that's fine with me. <clears throat> Moving on. Marie Moran, in a 2018 issue of Historical Materialism devoted to identity politics, offers the interesting argument that what we know as identity politics is a creation of the recent era of new social movements. When identity loses its earlier philosophical meaning, as in Hume or Locke, for instance, signifying an entity's sameness to itself, the term comes to refer to, here I quote her, substantive human property or attributes which may personally or collectively be possessed or indeed lost. Rigorously linking linguistic usage to recent political trends, Moran also helps to, clar uh, to clarify, at least for me, the difference between the, the use of the word identity and identity politics and, say, Georg Lukács' profound but rather vocabulary-bending description of the class-conscious proletariat as the identical subject-object of history. It's always been hard to get your mouth around that one. Nonetheless, Moran ri runs the risk of tossing out the historical baby with the linguistic bath for she overlooks the broad range of ways in which over the decades and indeed the centuries, senses of group-based belonging, even if not described polite, uh, precisely as identities, have functioned powerfully to shape people's self-concepts and behaviors. What was the new Negro movement of the 1920s, for instance, if not a concerted group effort to create an alternative to the old Negro, as well as a forthright rejection of Jim Crow racism? Going back further in history, what about the range of nationalist, religious, political, or even survival-based group affiliations that have, for better or for worse, motivated people to fight in trenches, go on crusades, participate in revolutions, or rebel against enslavement? That is, what kinds of collective self-identifications have served as mediations between what is and what can be? In a praiseworthy attempt at pinpointing identity politics as a recent phenomenon in capitalist society, and hardly a transcendent quest for modes of selfhood persisting throughout time, I certainly agree with her there, Moran minimizes the extent to which various social identities broadly construed have functioned to mediate between individuals and social formations in earlier phases of modernity, and indeed in pre-capitalist societies. That is, she jettisons the insights of a Marxist modes of production narrative, the insights that, it, that this can bring to, to bear upon the problem in intellectual and cultural history, that she has so usefully opened up for investigation. As Althusser reminds us, the ideologies summoning the subject to self-recognition have varied greatly over time, but interpolation is nothing new. A highly ambitious effort to bring Marxism to bear upon inter intersectionality, this is the third of the three that I'm grappling with very briefly here, and vice versa, is contained in an essay by Ashley Borer, also in the historical material in Michio mentioned, titled Intersectional, Intersectionality and Marxism, a Critical Historiography. Here she proposes a model for linking a broad range of social oppressions to their common foundation in capitalism. Economic class structure, she writes, is, I quote, merely one part of a complex and multifaceted system of domination in which patriarchy, white supremacy, colonization, both direct and indirect, and heterosexualism are fundamental constitutively ineradicable equi primordial elements. Sometimes these multisyllabic words are a lot. Equi primordial is important. Borer's posited plurality of positionings has the virtue of allowing for, indeed fostering, an understanding of the simultaneous, indeed intersectional, effectivity of these different causal factors, or might, might, one might say vectors. One problem with, with Borer's analytical framework, however, is that capitalism takes shape as a matrix of oppressions, but not as a form of class rule. Class figures instead as one among several modes of domination. Now, she's surely correct to point out that the hardships endured by the wage-earning earning proletariat hardly constitute the only, or often even, the principal source of suffering and alienation in the capitalist era. By separating out the victims of gendered, racialized, and colonial oppression from the proletariat, however, she describes this later category as inhabited mainly by white European men. This generalization was perhaps somewhat true in the time of Marx, but if we consider the increasingly diverse makeup of the present-day global proletariat, this proposition is clearly open to question. Another problem is that Borer's designation of class as one mode of domination among several others means that it is one more bad thing 
classism to be overcome. Indeed, those who argue for the primacy of a class-based structural analysis are viewed with suspicion, as if placing primacy upon class analysis as structural explanation is itself implicitly an act of domination. From a Marxist point of view, however, class supplies the basis of an analysis of oppression and inequality that enables a process of revolutionary negation and sublation, thereby fulfilling what Robin Kelly has called the freedom dreams of all oppressed peoples. A more serious problem, one more, okay, is that, uh, is that Boros' schema equates the structural foundation and reinforcement of various types of oppression operative in capitalism with their presumed genesis, that is, their common historical root in capitalism, as if capitalism is the only mode of production that has been sustained by a matrix of oppressions. Among the modes of oppression that Bora views as caused by capitalism, equivalent to colonialism and wage slavery, is the sexist oppression of women. And yet, as theorists and historians, from Friedrich Engels to Mira Mies to Maria Mies to Silvia Federici, have demonstrated, this phenomenon predates the earliest appearance of capitalist social relations by centuries, if not millennia. Again, as with Moran's inattention to the insights that the Marxist modes of production narrative could bring to bear upon our understanding of the connections between modern formulations of identity and past modes and expressions of group affiliation, Borer's insistence on viewing capitalism as the root of all evil, which of course in some ways it is, but <laughs> there's a historical problem, it precludes analysis of the ways in which, as Istvan Mazzaros has put it, capitalism opportuni opportunistically redimensions exploitative practices from earlier forms of class rule for present use. Bora's analysis of the intertwined effects, the intersection of simultaneous oppressions in the capitalist era, is potentially productive of very important insights. But her relegation of class to being merely one among several axes of causality and intermingling this with identity in various ways bespeaks a misunderstanding of what class analysis entails, as well as shows, I believe, her adherence to a kind of abiding distrust of meta-narrative, the kind of thing that I mentioned at the outset of my talk. Okay, I now move on to the consideration of three analytical categories prominent in, in current discussions of race and class anti-blackness, racial capitalism, and white privilege. Of particular interest to me is the relationship between and among identity, Marxism, and what's being talked about these days as ontology, though if anyone can deepen my understanding of how that term is being used, I'd be most appreciative. I don't mean that sardonically. <laughs> okay. Let me begin by noting very briefly that my own experience as a political activist over the many past many decades and also as a scholar and a teacher of literary radicalism and African-American literature, this has made me especially aware of the centrality of a specifically anti-black racism to life in the USA, past and present. The image of Michael Brown's state-murdered body left lying in the sun for six hours on a pavement in Ferguson, Missouri, has horrifically metonymic status, bringing to mind all kinds of images from the writings of Gene Toomer, Langston Hughes, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, James Baldwin, and Toni Morrison. While I'm fully aware of that the anti-black racism specific to the United States, or more broadly the Americas, the American experience, does not illuminate the Rwandan genocide of the 1990s, much less the current situation of the Rohingya, my particular positioning as a political being and a scholar leaves me at least open to hearing what the Afro-pessimists have had to say. So I've engaged with them somewhat seriously in thinking about the ideas that go into this talk. I have found, though, that the anti-blackness theorized by such Afro-pessimists as Frank Wilderson and Jared Sexton utterly fails to f supply an adequate explanation of anti-black racism, or for that matter, of any other form of racism. And in fact, as I, as, I, as I believe, this doctrine contributes to the reification of people of African descent that it presumably sets out to expose and contest. Wilderson writes that the interior of the slave ship remains the quintessential site of black consciousness. To be black is to be a slave. To be non-black is to be human, with a capital H. By reducing slavery to blackness, however, and blackness to slavery, this formulation overlooks the long history of slavery preceding the emergence of what we think of as race. This point is hardly original to me. The origin of the word slave in Slav, for instance, as in Yugoslavia, 
or the long history of ruling class racialization, of the English ruling class racialization of the Irish peasantry. These, you know, obviously call up a very different historical experience. For all of its anti-Americanism, moreover, the Afro-pessimist argument, excuse me, remains, remains tied to the very nationalism that it purports to reject, in that it takes the experience of U.S. chattel slavery as formative of blackness on a world scale. In addition, the proposition that the essence of anti-blackness is the desired social death of people of African descent, a phrase from Orlando Patterson, which is sort of reworked for this argument, that slavery entailed, not a, not, above all, not the accumulation of profit through back-breaking and body-destroying labor, but instead the accumulation of black bodies in order to sub subject them to gratuitous violence. This proposition ignores the fact that, at least in the U.S., enslaved Africans were historically t targeted for racialized super-exploitation. When, as Edward Baptist has recently shown, um, in this book uh, called the, the Half Has Not Been Told, I read it just a year or so ago. Enslaved Africans were quantified and used as the basis for collateralized debt in ways uncannily similar to the functioning of tranched mortgages leading up to the 2008 debt crisis. But the purpose of this e activity was not to effect social debt, but to squeeze as much surplus as possible out of their labor present and future. As Patrick Wolfe and Roxanne Dunbar-Artiz have pointed out, in ways that I'm sure are particularly relevant to the Canadian experience, it was indigenous people inhabiting the land desired for capitalist expansion who were principally targeted for racialized extirpation. By fixating upon the slave ship as the key symbol of the abiding existential situation of blackness, Afro-pessimism proposes a provocative connection between the mid-passage and the, and the, uh, and, and the um, warehoused bodies and shortened lives resulting from the accompanying from the present day phenomenon of mass incarceration. And that, that point in their argument drives home for me. As a histor historical contract, construct, however, the analogy uh, <clears throat> between the slave ship and the current existential situation of, of, of people of African heritage, uh, for it, it, it includes the extent to which contemporary ruling classes in many parts of the world, and certainly the United States, rely far more upon liberal multiculturalism as a primary means to ideological hegemony rather than white supremacy, even though a balance between these strategies we currently see can be worked out to accommodate different populations and regions with considerable flexibility. But Afro-pessimism has no way of explaining the presidency of, of Barack Obama, the phenomenon of what Kiyanga Yamata Taylor calls black faces in high places, or the enormous popularity of Michelle Obama's autobiographical becoming which is currently number one on the New York Times nonfiction non bestseller list. In short, the doctrine of anti-blackness cannot explain how blackness itself has historically been recruited and reconfigured to serve a range of ideological ends. Instead, it relies upon a fundamentally idealist, mystifying and ahistorical positioning of a positing of a libidinal economy, presumably shared by all people of European descent that drives them to desire, desire the social death of black bodies. The racist ideologies justifying anti-black racism, epistemologies that have come into being in history, are in this argument converted into immovable epistemes and then into static ontologies. Afro-pessimism is thus profoundly anti-dialectical in its insistence that anti-blackness possesses, as Willerson puts it, a non-relational status in connection with other ontologies. As a standalone category, in fact, he, puts the, he makes the argument, and I think Fred Moten, insofar as I can understand Fred Moten, seems to agree with this, uh, that, that the, the, the category of anti-blackness is even pre-ontological. It is neither the historical nor the ideological counterpart to white supremacy. Instead, it signifies a zone of nothingness from which emergence is impossible. As one might anticipate, then, Afro-pessimism is not only non-Marxist, but actively anti-Marxist. For it views Marxism's claim upon, focus upon class-based exploitation as a mirror of production that validates wage slavery as the path to social progress. Work is white, writes Wild, Wild, Wilderson. <coughs> Wilderson, Wilderson, Wilderson. I hope I get it right in saying Wilderson, okay? Work is white, he says, whereas we, many black people, were never meant to be workers. We were meant to be accumulated and die. 
One cannot imagine a stronger assertion of the incommensurability of the experiences and interests and identities of the different sectors of the world's laboring population. Postmodernist epistemological relativism returns in an especially distressing form. As a number of critics have pointed out, um, I think here of, of Greg Thomas and Annie Olakolobu Tariba, I'm, I hope I didn't slaughter her name there. She's on my list there that I you know, put up on the, on the board there. Afro-pessimism is in many ways a sitting duck for Marxist critique. You may be wondering then why I bothered to discuss it today. Well, as I said before, I take, it very, I take very seriously its focus upon anti-blackness, which is too often, often struff, sloughed over in discussions of race as a social construct. But I have another reason. In many ways, the complete obverse of Afro-pessimism, the theory of racial capitalism set forth in Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, The Making of the Black Radical Tradition, which first published in 1983, reissued in 2000, this book is, is being cited with increasing frequency these days among scholars seeking intellectual forebears in the project of linking capitalism with racism. Kevin Anderson and August Nimtz have effectively defended Marx and Engels from charges of personal racism. and They've also demonstrated the centrality of the critique of colonialism to Marx's understanding of primitive accumulation, as well as his recognition of the complete dependence of English wage slavery upon the continent produced by chattel slavery in the U.S. South. Nonetheless, as Nikhil Pak Singh and other Marxist theories have been, theorists have been pointing out, the analysis of surplus value extraction in capital is carried out at a level abstra of abstraction that makes it essentially colorblind and genderblind too, we should note. Robinson's book is frequently viewed as aligned with the sizable body of very significant historical and theor theoretical writing that crucially extends various aspects of Marxist methodology to the study of slavery, Jim Crow, and present day forms of racial exploitation and oppression. This tradition includes Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America, Eric Williams's Capitalism and Slavery, C.L.R. James's The Black Jacobins, Oliver Cox's Cla Cast, Class, Class, and Race, Lerone Bennett's The Shaping of Black America, Theodore Allen's The Invention of the White Race, Angela Davis's William R Women, Race, and Class, Karen, and, and Karen Fields and Barbara Fields' Racecraft, David Rodeker and Elizabeth Esch's The Creation of Inequality, I mean, there's, a, there's quite a tradition here, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore's The Golden Gulag. A new book featuring Robinson as a significant contributor to this legacy is contained in the 2017 volume titled Futures of Black Radicalism. So why then might we ask, is Robinson's black Marxism attacking, uh, attracting particular attention these days? Well, for reasons that are mixed, on the one hand, they say a good deal about the enduring value of Robinson's groundbreaking work, but also about its peculiar compu compatibility with certain strands of anti-Marxism continuing to shape thinking about race and class. On the one hand, Robinson insists upon the centrality of the re racialization of subjected laboring populations, white as well as black, to the project of capital accumulation, hence the notion of racial capitalism. Race and racism, he's also written, are merely, are merely covers for class. And indeed, citing the example of the Irish, racialized, as I said before, by the English landowning class, he notes, I quote here, racism is not about color. Instead, the concept of race became a way of controlling labor. Ruth Gilmore, expressing her intellectual debt to Robinson, has declared, I quote her, the racial and racial capitalism isn't secondary. Capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines it. Angela Davis, noting the confirming utility of the notion of racial capitalism, notes that, I quote, global capitalism cannot be adequately comprehended if the racial dimension of capitalism is ignored. For all its focus on the inequities of racial capitalism, however, Black Marxism's antidote is not the eradication of capitalism through proletarian revolution, but instead, and here I quote Gregory Myerson, who puts the point well, and said, sees the, the antidote as, quote, a culturalist alternative that interprets Marxism as an insufficient internal critique of a Eurocentrism that is rooted in a fundamentally racist and violence-prone Western metaphysic. And this Western metaphysic is, in Robinson's words, incommensurable with the, sh with the shared epistemology that, other one that characterizes the black radical tradition. The contradictions in Robin Robinson's analysis are striking. Although he elsewhere views slavery and the exploitation as historically specific phenomena accompanying capitalist class rule, 
in these latter statements that I just quoted, he alludes to the mechanisms of self-destruction inherent in Western civilization, Western civilization. Although the figure of the Negro in racist discourse was a wholly distinct ideological construct, he maintained on one hand, on the other hand, in the, the other side of his argument, he maintains that this construct was nonetheless, I quote, the culmination of a process a thousand years long and one at the root of European historical identity, a formulation that would set the origins of the Negro back in the European Dark Ages. Okay. So the two universals that Robinson's setting forth here are fundamentally incompatible with one another. We need to look at them both, but we can't, we have to find out, we have to determine which one is true or at least truer than the other. Okay. The resemblance between these observations by Robinson and the far more developed doctrine of ontological incommensurability proposed by the Afro-pessimists should not be overemphasized, and I do not want to do that. But neither can this overlap be totally ignored. Robinson's essentialist approach to whiteness, moreover, is accompanied at times by an equally essentialist description of African cultures, as all of them, intrinsically peace-loving. A broad generalization that would have a hard time accounting for the large-scale violence of the Haitian Revolution, especially in the, as led by Dessalines, and I, by the way, that was a praiseworthy large-scale violence, or the evidence of the bloody militaristic domination pr practiced by the rulers of Dahomey, residual signs of which shocked Zora Neale Hurston during her mid-1930s trip to West Africa. Finally, Robinson's not infrequent expressions of skepticism toward, the, toward Marxist historical materialism are accompanied, it bears noting, by occasionally direct jabs at the legacy of communism. Black Marxism, his book, contains, for instance, a highly sympathetic treatment of Harold Cruz's 1967 anti-communist screed titled The Crisis of the, Inter of the Negro Intellectual, which argues, and here I quote Robinson, not Cruz, that the great brainwashing of, of, rad of Negro radical intellectuals was not achieved by the capitalistic bourgeoisie, but by Jewish intellectuals in the American Communist Party, unquote. Robinson's oscillation between historical materialism and ontological essentialism, between an affirmative Marxism and a programmatic anti-communism, may to some degree reflect not only the pressures of the Cold War, he did publish this book in 1983 after all, but also contemporaneous shortcomings in theorizing about race and class in the Marxist tradition. Some of the most important, more recent work in this vein, including the groundbreaking work of, of Theodore Allen, was undertaken after the original publication of Black Marxism. Nonetheless, we can suspect, we can speculate that this oscillation may be part of the reason why Robinson's work on racial capitalism is preferentially cited as a forebear by present day theorists and historians who appear far more comfortable with the radicalism of the 60s and 70s, thought about and configured in various kinds of ways, than with a heritage of earlier 20th century socialist and especially communist movements, which is not to put down the radicalism of the 60s and 70s. That's where I come from, okay? <laughs> but still, it can be portrayed in a somewhat skewed way. If we scrutinize the terms used these days to describe the goals of movements of social justice, we come across the following. Decoloniality, abolition democracy, abolition of the carceral state, abolition society not based on capital, Abolition geography, abolition is all over the place, fair enough. Redistribution, recognition, post-capitalism, destabilization of capitalism, and revolutionary intercommunalism, which comes from the Black Panther Party. <clears throat> and noticely, I've, I've noticed that with the exception of Asad Haider <laughs> and Kianga Mahata Taylor, they, they really are the exceptions to the rule. Um, the word socialism, which is out there, right, in public discourse, doesn't tend to come out in the academic writing that deals with race and class in the way that I've been discussing it. But the closest we come to the rhetoric guiding earlier leftist movements are various e echoes of the phrase self-determination. And this concept, linked as it is to the problematic history of revolutionary nationalisms, some of which have devolved into not-so-revolutionary nationalisms, this term contains a multitude of contradictions of its own. This complex genealogical relationship between present day identity aligned movements on the one hand, and on the other, the, the legacy of the old left, the new left, the race and gender based radical movements of the 60s and 70s, embodied in such formations as the Cumbia River Collective, which is mentioned very frequently in this writing, as well as the Black Panther Party, 
All of this genealogy is, in my view, extremely well worth exploring. Amidst all this theorization about race and class, the nut that still has to be cracked is the phenomenon of whiteness, often posited as the problem of the white working class, if at times this formulation is accompanied by sort of hazy descriptions of what working class and middle class actually are. Here we need to dis briefly to descend from the heights of theory to the realm of empirical data. I recently investigated statistics regarding income distribution county by county in New York State. And unfortunately, 2010 was the latest full set that I could get, so it's somewhat out of date, but you'll get the point anyhow. The poorest county in terms of median income in 2010, uh, the, the median income was $17,575, was the Bronx, the blackest, brownest, and least gentrified girl in New York City. The next dozen or so poorest counties, however, were all in, in upstate New York, far upstate New York. And first among these is Franklin County with an 86% white population right up by the ca Canadian border, north of the Adirondacks. And there the citizens enjoy an annual median income of $19,807. It's more than noteworthy, as Gilmore would surely point out, that Franklin County contains, I've counted, um, I think, seven federal and state prisons. Now, these no doubt supply a significant portion of the jobs available to residents. But it's worth noting that when we, even when we factor in these jobs, the median income is incredibly low. The children of prison guards are not exactly eating nutritious food. While it could be argued that the white workers in Franklin County have an in interest in the continuing incarceration of the largely black and brown population in the prison industrial complex, what kind of interest is this, we should ask, okay? And by the way, the statistics about race and income that I just you know, presented are, are not cherry-picked. If you look at, take a look at Taylor's book or at an article by Walter Ben Michaels, whom I don't admire in some ways, but who does some useful work called The Politics of Anti-Racism, um, you you'll get a much fuller portrayal of, of, of uh, data basically supporting the point that I was just making. Now consider, too, some statistics surrounding excuse me, the racial demographic of police murders which have inspired the founding and the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement. According to a Washington Post survey, in the United States, there were 990 fatal police shootings in 2015, compared to 22 in Canada, Michael Moore would love that, <laughs> three in the UK, two in Germany, and zero in Japan. The great majority of the victims were men. In the United States, 50% of those killed were white, 25.1% were black. Now, since about 63% of the U.S. population is white, and 13% black, this is clear evidence of racism. Black men are, were 2.5 times more likely to be shot and killed than whites by the police. In raw terms, though, twice as many whites were shot as blacks. In the 18 to 29-year-old group, if you break a group, you break down the demographics a bit more, the ratio of black to white was five to one. All right, that's where the the names, the Freddies that we hear about come from, right? Under, under 18, Tamir Rice, five to two. Notably though, for whatever reason, in the category of men ages 45 to 54, white men were killed at a slightly higher rate. Now my point in invoking these statistics is not to substitute all lives matter for black lives matter, nor am I proclaiming that class is essential and race epiphenomenal. But it is to make the point that a militarized state bent upon a coercive control of the population as a whole, using racist rationalizations to consolidate its power, affects the white working class as well. And are these the rewards of whiteness? The data also show that a white man living in Germany has 1 64th the chance of being killed by the police than, than, than has a white man of that age group living in the United States. So you can sort of see where I'm going with this. Cui bono. Some history, which is uh, some history, which is probably familiar to you, so I'm going to go, go through it quickly, is also relevant here. Just we need to remind ourselves, as various historians have pointed out. I think of Lerone Bennett, Theodore Allen, Barbara Fields, Yellow Van Pater, and Van Decca. When the first Ar Africans arrived in Jamestown in 1619, there were, as Allen puts it, no white people there. Asad Hyder quotes the same quote. That is, no people of European descent were identified as white. In fact, the word white did not appear in Virginia statute law until 1691, close to the very end of the century. 
There are numerous records of substantial unity among white indentured servants, African indentured servants, African slaves, and Indians, or African born in Africa, or of African descent, and Indians well into the 17th century. The value of whiteness needed to be imposed upon the white laboring population through the pulpit, the press, and the hard hand of the law, including flogging. Blackness became only gradually associated with servitude for life, though, of course, it's clear what that was going to mean. This early colonial period, by the way, before the hardening of racial demographics and ideologies is portrayed in all its complexity in Toni Morrison's quite wonderful 2000 novel, 2007 novel titled A Mercy, which I highly recommend. The 1676-77 Bag Bacon's rebellion against the governor of Virginia, also, however, for the seizure of indigenous lands, which is no small issue, but Bacon's rebellion was carried out by a multiracial band of black and white. And one of its demands, should it win, which it did not, was that everyone, slave or bonds person, black or white, be free. Even after the consolidation of racial lines appeared complete, and basically Bacon's, the defeat of Bacon's rebellion was an absolute watershed in terms of a kind of class struggle in colonial United States. But even after the consolidation of racial lines appeared complete, there were sporadic multiracial rebellions against a foe known by white and black participants alike as the white men, the men in laces. In this, that was in the 1741 New York City slave revolt. Uh, this has been recorded by Peter Linebaugh and Marcus Redeker in their book called The, the Many-Headed Hydra, another great book. Such instances of class-conscious multiracial unity would continue to occur through the decades and centuries to come in the discovery of common cause by poor white farmers and freedmen during Black Reconstruction, in the populist movement of the 1890s and well into the 20th century, including communist-led organizing of sharecroppers in the 1930s and in the 1960s and 70s, multiracial job actions led by radical black workers in Detroit's automobile industry and also in the 1970 nationwide postal workers' strike. My purpose in mentioning these present statistics and past moments in history is not to present a rose-tinged portrait of multiracial proletarian unity, past or present. During Jim Crow, plenty of poor farmers and, and workers participated in lynchings of the most brutal kind in huge numbers. Right? And later, plenty of poor farmers and workers have supported racist movements against school busing and changing neighborhoods. I guess not so many farmers involved in that at this point. It's clear that white supremacist and nativist ideas are gaining, gaining currency in significant sectors of the U.S. population and elsewhere in the world, as events in New Zealand just showed. New Zealand. I'll, I'll leave aside for now a consideration of the complex mediations of both coercion and consent by which racialized identities and racist practices circulate in present-day capitalist society. My question is, whose interests are served? And this comes to my final set of points here. We, now, we thus come to the notion of white privilege, a term that remains largely uninterrogated in current discussions of race and class. Is there such a thing? Does the term describe a, a situation of objective benefit for the majority of people that be, can be classified as, quote unquote, white? An enormous amount is at stake in how we analyze this problem. For if most white people actually stand to gain from the lesser standard of living broadly measured in every way that we've been talking about of racialized others, then there are no material grounds for multiracial class-based unity. Expanded humanistic compassion, much less white guilt, will take us only so far. We might as well end it sold up our social justice tents and go home or else participate in a politics of alliance, a kind of arm's length from one another. So I'll put the point in a slightly different way. Does, does differential treatment equal objective benefit? Does that portion of the population, population coded as white enjoy a better life because of or in spite of ruling class imposed that racist, racist differentials. Is white identity a baited hook, as Noel Ignatin, well, we, that's, that's how we knew him in the old SDS, he became Noel Ignatiev, right? Put it, put it a, bait, a baited hook, or as um, Alan puts it, as a bribe. Does the average white person go about t toting a knapsack of privileges that, according to Peggy McIntosh, amount to something of real value? Or Tim Wise, you may have read some of his work, uh, he also talks about privilege as a source of tremendous guilt, all right? These are real questions because racialized differences do emphatically exist. 
How, can, how, how then can objective benefit be assessed and understood? Theorists like the Afro-pessimists, who view the libidinal interest of whites in the project of anti-blackness as an actual investment, one that pays dividends, they need not confront this question, for it answers itself. If, however, non-elite ordinary white people, and here I'm leaving aside the term white working class, which can take on a kind of superior tone in these discussions, if these ordinary white people end up being caught on the baited hook and find themselves gasping on the shore, then taking the bait here, accepting the mediation of social selfhood through the category of white identity, then taking the bait has hardly been in their interest. Indeed, swallowing the hook has been a classic manifestation of false consciousness, that is, an ideologically coded act manifestly against the interests of the person who has undertaken, has, who has undertaken it. And let me just repeat the point here that if we believe that there are objective universals and we repudiate incommensurability and relativism, then we have to embrace some kind of notion of false consciousness. It's not, an, it's not a concept that Marxists should be apologetic about. Okay, in order to get the full import of the issues at stake here, I find it crucially important to get past economism and social democratic thinking. And here I'm thinking of the very useful but limited work by the econo of left-wing economists like Michael Reich and Victor Perlow, who clearly demonstrate how racist wage differentials hold down the wages of white workers. I mean, the point is, is a clear and important one, but it, it's, it's limited. We need to bring to bear the full weight of the Marxist tradition which in its narrative of modes of production stretches from the past to the future. For economism focuses on short-term interest. From this standpoint, it may well be in the interest of an unemployed white working class man in rural Franklin County, New York, to take a job at a newly opened medium security prison specializing in the incarceration of black men from the Bronx. Even though the pay is terrible, he can't afford to fix his car, his kids are dropping out of high school, his marriage is on the rocks because he drinks too much, and also because he runs the risk, albeit small, of actually being killed in a prison uprising. uprising. The historian David Rodiger, increasingly unequal, un uneasy, excuse me, in this post-2000 period about using the term white privilege, for reasons that are, should be pretty obvious, now prefers the term white advantage. Advantage is, I guess, better than privilege because it, 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 it highlights the comparative situation at stake, whereas privilege sounds absolute. But advantage still implies objective benefit. My question, how about flipping the script? How about viewing the prison guard's situation and the question of material self-interest, which of course is material group interest, from the vantage point of a communist future and describe him, the prison guard, as less oppressed rather than more advantaged or more privileged in relation to the work to the men he is assigned to watch over. Why not establish the political and ethical baseline for assessing where we are now from the standpoint of where we wish to go? From this standpoint, which is at once political, epistemological, and dare I say, prospectively ontological, and I think it's also moral, from this standpoint, we can readily see that both the prison guard and the inmate have a common interest in living in a very different kind of world. And by the way, my example of the, of the guard is kind of provocative because most people who live in Franklin County are like earning a minimum wage for a 30-hour-a-week job at a 7-Eleven. But I wanted to make it stark, okay? I'm aware, of course, that this proposition leaves me open to the charge of utopianism and that part three of the Communist Manifesto, as well as Engels' Socialism and Utopian Scientific, can be brandished before my eyes. But we should recall that Marx described communism as a real movement in the present, as well as a future goal to be realized. We should also re recall that in What is to be Done, Lenin wrote of the need for revolutionary dreaming beyond the cons constraints of the movement, which is part of what he means about the Marxist-Leninists or the social democrats, as he called them at that time, coming from outside. It's useful to bear in mind Ernst Bloch's crucially important distinction between compensatory utopia, which simply papers over the contradictions of the painful present through wish fulfillment, and anticipatory utopia, which envisions the possible future dialectically embodied embed and embedded in the seeds of the present. With the 18th Brumaire in mind, we need to take our poetry from the future and think what notions of identity might characterize a society in which the various forms of exploitation and oppress oppression with which we are all too familiar have been superseded? 
and in which material welfare is not simply premised upon redistributive justice, which is the limit beyond which many radicals, let alone liberals, cannot think in the present, and what could be called contributive justice, based upon a supersession of the racialized and gendered division of mental and manual labor, and in fact, the complete division of mental and manual labor throughout society, as well as the abolition of money as a means of anything other than keeping track of, of who goes where. And I would say that this notion of contributive justice, which is outlined by the philosopher Paul Gomberg in a very interesting book um, called How to Make Opportunity Equal, um, he, he talks about um, contributive justice as a kind of, of, as a cluster property. I think that's a Wittgensteinian term or something, which means that it comprises many components, material, and also even you know the category of recognition, which tends to be used just by liberals these days, and that's why I was talking about social justice entails, because in fact, people need recognition for the work that they do. It's unalienated labor, and that's what they're contributing to society. So that recognition, I think, becomes a communist principle. Anyhow, I, I, can't, I can't outline that the way Gomberg does. It's a very interesting book, take my word for it. Coming to the end here, to posit the need for communist universalism is not to hold before our eyes a tantalizing but chimerical false universal, an idealist vision of transcendence that only detracts attention from the hard practical business of making change in the here and now. By contrast, bearing in mind the revolutionary Marxist notion of objective human needs of both the stomach and the imagination should make us more aware of the dialectical potential for transformation that exists right now within the movements to which we are and must remain active and committed. Interpreting the world correctly, or at least as correctly as we can, should help us change it more effectively. This future-oriented commitment to the conjunction of theory and practice will make us better organizers as well as better comrades, for it means that we will be seeking out and finding and acting upon evidence of what the proletarian writer, Tilly Olson, one of my favorites, what she called the not yet in the now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just whip my whistle a little no. bit. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, so okay. a lot of issues on the table, and I think, okay. uh, yeah, to say the least, and I think uh, there's a lot of publications and but incredible okay. and comprehensive <laughs> okay. course okay. across a <laughs> whole range of literatures. Um, okay. No, have it be okay if we're recording the, Q, the question and answers? Is that okay? If not, we can turn it off. What are people's feelings on that? Everybody's okay with that? If no one has an objection to it? I think no? it would be fruitful. I'd, okay. Yeah, I'd, okay, yeah. good. Then, then we'll leave it uh, going then. But everybody should be clear. So then I'm just going to turn, I'm just gonna turn yeah. and, and record, like video everybody. That's okay. So the floor is open now for questions, comments, you know, uh, criticisms, and so on. Um, and uh, did yeah. no? Okay. What do you? Did you want? Did you want some? You want something to eat or more water or something like that? Or um, uh, you, you know, can okay. refill my water. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know what that. Was <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Nico, sure. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. That one. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Steve. Mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a no, I'm fine. Thank you. I'll, I'll go ahead. Your name is? Nico. I'm a grad student. Okay. Uh, in this department, I work with Harvard and some of you. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. It was really, really impressive. And I feel like you do an amazing job of stitching together a lot of the most sort of exciting and provocative work that I know of and quite a bit more right. in this field. Um, the Yeah, and, and, and for the first... Um, for a while there, I was wondering if you had read the, the Michael Reich uh, book, um, which I just want to kind of mention because I think it addresses, I understand you know, your suggestion that it's limited, but I, I just mm -hmm. want to give mm -hmm. some context for it because I think it really does address some, to explain what it's yeah, 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 yeah. some of the like, important questions that work there. So, it's a, uh, so he's an economist at Berkeley and he, uh, he's, still teaching there. He came out with a book in 1979 called Racial Inequality, which um, looked at income distributions ac across uh, racial groups in the United States, in the 50 largest municipalities in the United States. And what he found was that, and so the, the question was, do whites benefit from black oppression, black marginalization, black poverty? 
And and the the conclusion was that they don't because mm -hmm. in the uh, in municipalities that had higher concentrations of black poverty actually also had higher prevalences of white poverty. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas municipalities sort of on the, on the opposite end of the spectrum had higher rates of unionization um, and higher concentrations of sort of professional uh, jobs rather than um, service jobs and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so I think that, I don't know, I, I think it's a really sort of powerful and obviously mm -hmm. also an empirical insight. And I, I really wish that the work would be updated. In fact, I, mm -hmm. I emailed yeah. him once asking if he had an, any interest in I that. would like to see that, too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I think that that um, the, the principle that we're witnessing there, where higher rates of uh, racial disparity and racial division in the lower tiers of society, in the poorer, mm -hmm. in the bottom tiers of society, uh, actually operating in a manner that disadvantages every, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. basically everybody everybody in the bottom half of society gives uh, and, and is associated with higher uh, concentrations of income in the top one percent stuff like that is is a, is a sort of principle that I think can be also observed in some of the other like non-economic dimensions of, of racial politics including even gun violence you know I think that like when, um, I, I see the, the heritage of gun violence and gun culture in the United States as being deeply connected to its racial history. Um, and yet it's like, it's, uh, as you mentioned, it's something that sort of renders whites as well as black in the final analysis and in reality uh, so much more vulnerable to uh, both, you know, mass shootings and as well as uh, no doubt to... Uh, attacks by the police and stuff like that. So um, I don't know. I guess basically I'm just saying that's kind of like where I'm at in my understanding of this yeah, yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, do you want to? No, I, <laughs> I could I just be talking in the background. Um, my, my comment was, I'm, I'm glad you, you said that, because I find, I find Reich's work very valuable. I don't know if you're f familiar with the work of Victor Perlow. He was a member of the CPUSA, and he wrote two books, The Economics of Racism One and The Economics of Racism Two. And what he focused on, and very valid, is the extent to which the racism in the South absolutely sandbagged the possibilities for unionization, which really sandbagged the wages, therefore, of white workers as well as black workers. So, I mean, all of those points, you know, are, are valid. And, and also, there's um, an economist, I believe her name is pronounced Bonasich, Edna Bonasich who has also written about, you know, labor competition um, <clears throat> and, you know, differential levels and all of that. No, I, I think it's a good place to start. The reason, the only reason I was being critical is that I think if one thinks in purely economic terms, one can fall into thinking in economistic terms, okay, and think in terms of the, you know, because the, the bourgeois economists always want us to think about the limited pie, right, and we all fight over our shares of the limited pie. And I think that one of the advantages of thinking of communism, future mode of production, and all of that is, you know, the tremendous expansion of potential for all kinds of things in life um, that make then thinking about wage differentials in the present necessary, but a fairly local thing, you know. So it's not as if there's really an antagonism between the two, but I just think that this is a time when things are so bad and yet so good in some ways, and it's, it's, it's an opportunity for us to think in terms of, of a big picture and not just of the next one or two steps that need to be taken, but of where we would like the world to be 50 or 100 years from now. And that's where I think that, you know, thinking beyond the dollars and cents of the wage pool is, is useful, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know. For sure. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, I would ask, ask a question. Well, oh, somebody, somebody else? Guess. Okay. The, the young woman over there had a question before, but she doesn't anymore. Okay, can you go? Well, a lot of people are thinking about some of their questions. One I would have was thinking yeah. about the Black Panthers, right? Because yeah. in a way, I think, I, I personally think that that connection, right? I mean, and coming out of a long tradition, and there was someone writing, I can't block his name, but I know Alan refers to him a lot. Uh, a guy who came out of the Socialist Party, had worked with Debs and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Robinson? Uh, uh, Wait, uh, but, Robinson. But, but the, 
The Black Panthers? No, no, no. They oh, came no. out to addition. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. they, they, that's going back to the race and class question. Yeah, Bill, I, think, I think William Robinson was his name, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Anyhow, yes, I think yeah. it was. You yeah. know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Alan wrote a lot about him as a guy who's an organic intellectual who's been trying to organize right. all their work. You're probably right. familiar with it. I right. forgot yeah. it was Perry or something like that. But, yeah. but so this long tradition of thinking, you know, of kind of almost not, in a strange way, not problematizing. I mean, mm -hmm. so clearly, you know, clearly understanding that how is how this in a sense it's not difficult that it's just it's a register of oppression right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, in a sense mm -hmm, and really mm -hmm. the panthers have matriculated and, and which and that mm -hmm. it's not the only and that class you know it almost was not it was not trying to establish um any uh sort of hierarchy or even just uh mm -hmm. evenness but it all it, this is one form in which it which the race question it takes mm -hmm, place, and mm -hmm, therefore, mm -hmm. but however, not the only, and therefore allowed them to make alliances such as mm -hmm. to uh, white ap Appalachians, for example, right? right? right, right. Uh, anybody's familiar with this? And, you know, there's even a work on a hillbilly national nationalism. Yeah, I know, I know, a, I know. There's a problem with that, though. Yes, there is. There is. There totally is. The Martin Luther King's poor persons movement was yeah, early, and they had people. gotten inspired by that. Right. But nonetheless, I mean, no, the point is not whether that's a successful strategy or not, and all that. Mm -hmm. It's the question that they had thought in that way, right? That sort of, yeah. and and the sense of what, it, and somehow or another, I, I feel somehow like that it's been lost in a sense, like some mm -hmm. of that, I mean, maybe because people found it too too smooth in a sense, too, that was sort of a, I, no. I guess what, you know It wasn't I mean? smooth for the Panthers. No, 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 I don't mean <laughs> yeah. smooth political practice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the the yeah. way that this, this sort of way it was, uh, the idea, the formation of the ideology, mm -hmm. in a sense, non-problematizing in a sense that we now, Mm -hmm. In a, we, you know, when I, mean, I say that, I use that word in the sense that in our current age, mm -hmm, we mm -hmm, see mm -hmm. how you know this problem. This is why we have, you know, which is why the, the, your your talk and so on, you know, yeah. and it's sort of and, and to what degree this connection back right. and how okay. that's been almost yeah. not completely passed over, but I mean, not well, Kelly, of course. I see Kelly maybe is the most continuous in a certain way. Robin Kelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah in a yeah, way, right? Yeah. It kind of, in a way, it's kind of like. You know, like he's just sitting the same way. I, I know mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm, being a little mm -hmm. bit vague here because mm -hmm, I'm capturing mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. that's not, yeah, in yeah, a sense, yeah. not deeply problematized. Therefore, it's, it's almost yeah. difficult to speak of, in a sense. Okay, right? yeah. yeah. Well, I, first of all, I, I just speak sort of anecdotally, okay? Because uh, when I was in my first year in graduate school and I had just sort of been radicalized in the last year in college, class of 69, okay? Um, and I'm in Chicago and Judge Julius Hoffman has Bobby Seale gagged in the courtroom, you know. And then that, that fall of 69, Mark Hampton and, and Fred, I mean, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark are blown away in their beds. Um, that doesn't prove anything except to say that <laughs> what was going on with the Panthers was, was very important in my own process of radicalization, okay. Um, it's also true that the, the ruling class was scared to death of the Black Panther Party, um, you know not only because of what they were doing with the cops, but the way that they were exposing the, the phony CIA connections of Ron Karenga and the so-called cultural black nationalists and all of that, were, you know. So the attack by COINTELPRO and everything was, was very serious. And to this day, just last anecdotal point, there are, there are still people um, coming out of prison now who are in the Black Panther Party. I mean, so. <clears throat> on the other hand, so there's on the one hand, on the other hand, um, I think it's easy to have a romance of the Black Panther Party now, and I think that some of the people who write about it now, as some of the people who write about the Cumbie River Collective, I have a kind of romance of it. And it's not to say that the romance is all wrong, because these were people who were talking about it in a very serious way, dealing with sexism and dealing with racism, and dealing with the conjunction of sexism and racism, but, also, but we're also anti-capitalist, right? Which is, you know, very much, you know, I think that the core of, of the question that you're asking there. But um, part of what was going on, though, was um, was a politics of coalition and alliance. And there's a lot that can be said about that that's very good. But um, Keonga Taylor has an interesting point in, in her book there, which is that <clears throat> a politics, if you say, I'm going to be an ally, um, it's almost like you have a choice of being an ally or not. Okay, there's, there's not that much of a structurally based commitment to seeing the, the, the absolute material self-interest and basis for solidarity. And so coming back to the, the, the Panthers, I mean, what was going on was you had the young lords who were sort of organizing among the Puerto Ricans, and you had the Panthers who were doing what they were doing in the, in the black community, and then you had 
um, Nolan Dayton's group, I forget exactly what they called them, it'll come to me in a moment, um, and they would meet in a coalitional kind of way, but the idea was white people organize white people, black people organize black people, et cetera. And that was valuable in many ways, but there was also a kind of limit to it, okay? And I think that that limit to it then, you know, sort of has contributed to, you know, the, the fact that the <clears throat> revolutionary nationalism that was embodied in the Black Panther pro program sort of dissipated. And you, Bobby Rush, who came to speak this 1969 SDS convention where I was present, okay, he, you know, became a city councilman in the city of Chicago. And, you know, so the, the anti-capitalism was not communist anti-capitalism. It was pretty damn good, okay? It was the best thing going on at the time. But I, I think that, you know, for those of us who are, you know, seriously trying to think about a, a newer and, and different world, it's, it's so important to be as materialist as possible about what, what all the strengths were, have been of past movements and what the shortcomings were, okay? Um, I mean, I've made a whole project of, of looking at the 1930s, because that's, you know, and I see tremendous, you know, strengths and wonderful things in the, in the, from the 30s that basically no one but Robin Kelly really talks about anymore these days just because of the kind of anti-communism that surrounds talking about the, the American Communist Party to this day. But they had you know, some serious, serious weaknesses as well. So I just think that you know, as we're trying to understand where we need to go, I think, I think these political genealogies are, are, are super important. And um, you know, the kind of alliance that the Panthers were talking about and the way they were contesting capitalism which, by the way, was also, it was adventurous. I mean, they didn't have the base to challenge the police the way they did. It was tragic. It was tragic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It was tragic. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for the talk. And I mean, I especially enjoyed your reading of the HM special issue. And for instance, very you're the you one were, who turned me on to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I did really enjoy it. And I, I think we, we, we overlap very much, like in our okay. reading of it. And I think what you're catching as the you know the third point you made about Ashley Bowers that um, modes of production versus uh, mere ontogenesis argument. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that really goes. I, I mean, they do have I think common roots with Cedric Robinson's mm -hmm. reading of racial capitalism, that kind of ontogenesis versus uh, the modes of production debate. But what I find interesting is that, and I agree with your analysis of collapsing epistemology with an ontology. Mm -hmm. But I think what I find missing, and therefore politically in terms of organizing, mm -hmm. problematic in the talk is a role of a phenomenology, an everyday phenomenology of racism, for instance. Because mm -hmm. it is one thing to say that, you know, like, yes, there are these, you know, this much they are making, that much they are making, et cetera. And, you know, like, white worker doesn't necessarily have an interest in the oppression of the black worker. But nonetheless, what we do not know is the making of whatever that is, the white worker, right? Like, in terms of, yes, we do talk about, you know, there are a lot of critical whiteness studies talking about, you know, like white privilege, white advantage, and so on. But the thing is that, how is it that, for instance, again, anecdotally, and things that I have seen, mm -hmm. that people completely in rough conditions living, and you see them probably high on something in a very miserable condition just next to a subway in Toronto, a white person, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, he has lost everything, all consciousness, it seems. Mm -hmm. The one thing he didn't lose is his racism. Mm -hmm. And yelling at people, black people in particular, mm -hmm. all kind of, like, you know, unutterable names, really. Mm -hmm. I can believe it. Or another crazy person, you know, running around and calling Asians zipper head. I didn't know what zipper head was. I had to look yeah. it up. It is from Vietnam War. And when the, mm -hmm. you know, American soldiers mm -hmm. are running through with their, you know, tanks and stuff of Asian people, it makes the uh, zipper-like pattern on the bodies of Asian people. So, I mean, once you live, then <clears throat> the thing is that given that we do not have the socialist consciousness that we would like to have, and therefore the kind mm -hmm. of, and I very much agree, that kind of communist universalism, but it seems like it's not necessarily, it is a vantage point that we would like to speak from, but not necessarily it's not available to us historically at the moment. 
then how do we bridge that gap between taking that standpoint and because I do agree mm -hmm. that we need to have a compelling argument in the making of our universalism mm -hmm. but on the other hand this problem of the you know like everyday phenomenology of racism right. and for instance Fanon talking about how you know like when he was called the n-word right. he had under the body schema he calls it the historical social schema so how do we account for that the making of the historical racial schema to the extent that really makes now quite difficult for any kind of socialist project that we have. So what are some things that you would tell us in terms of organizing, for instance? Oh, well, I mean, this is a very common answer. Way, yeah. of, way of asking yeah, that, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, what you're describing is, is something that's very painful. And um, there are a lot of people out there who are casualties of the system. You know, and that quote unquote crazy person who's saying these terrible racist things is not going to change. Right? You know. So I mean so then the question becomes when we're talking about the phenomenology of, of racism, to what extent is our information anecdotal versus statistical? I mean, which are such different ways of you know, not either one of them is, is necessarily all that um, powerful. I, I guess the the, the okay. Let me go back a step. <clears throat> I, I mentioned the phrase multi-racial unit, multi unity in the fight against racism. A lot of people feel uneasy with that phrase. Let me just, I'll, I'll come back to where you are, okay? Because there's a kind of suspicion that white folks are gonna take over, something like that. So you don't say multi-racial unity in the fight against racism. You talk about alliance, you talk about coalition, you talk about this or that. Um, I think that there is a positive good in multi-racial unity in the fight against racism. I think it's an objective good in the world right now. It's not something that we have to wait for for the great communist by and by, okay? So what are the things to be done now? I mean, I think, I don't know what's going on on this campus. But as I was coming in, I saw a lot of, it's, it's, it looked sort of like Rutgers University, Newark, where you have a lot, of, a lot of little bit of everybody, and it seemed that a lot of little bit of everybody was talking to one another. Um, I think that to the extent that people can, op can can communicate and participate in, in movements, whether it's against the tuition hike or, or whatever, in a way that, that builds solidarity at every level. I mean, I think a lot of racism in the, in the mind and the consciousness of somebody, and it's not just white people who are racist, you know. You've got black people who are racist against other black people. You've got people from West Indies who are racist against Americans. I mean, there's, it's, you know, it's all over there. Though I will admit that, indeed, white racism is the most toxic in terms of its, of its effects. Um, I think that if people can have the experience of countering that, that in fact people can change. Last, uh, uh, to be anecdotal for a moment, okay. Once I was going on a May Day march down in Washington, and it was a very multiracial group of people on the bus, okay. And there was this one white working class guy, it was his first time coming to May Day, and he was somebody's friend. And he had on his arm an iron cross a Nazi Iron Cross, okay? Because that's where he had been at politically a few years before, and some of these young black dudes on this bus are seeing this guy with his Iron Cross, like, you know, what's going on? Anyhow, luckily there were several hours <laughs> between going, leaving New Jersey and going down to Washington, and they just talked about it all, and the point is that it's almost like he had had a conversion. He'd seen the light or something, which I don't make it, make it sound religious, but the point is he had changed his mind. All right, and by the time we got to Washington, where in fact we were going to march through a neighborhood which was largely black, they knew that if his bicep was clear, he might be in danger. So they gave him a shirt to cover up his, you know, arm and all of that. Again, it's a story, right? But I mean, to me, it's it's typical, or it embodies the kind of thing that we can do now. But I, I think this, I mean, I've been I've been in coalitions and alliances all my life. Okay, um, I'm in the Women of Color and Allies chapter of the National Organization for Women in the state of New Jersey. Yes, I am, right? And the Allies thing is right in there. Um, but the, 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 the more we can get beyond this notion of just sort of, you have your turf and I have mine and you have your, well, the more we can really bring it together. Um, and, well, I, I'm, I, I think I'm repeating myself at this point, but you know, the, the profound interaction on all levels is something to aim for right now.
And it was more, it was in line with what you were asking. Um, I, I was wondering if you could clarify the comment that you made about that black pe people also being racist towards other black people. The way I understand racism, it was a system devised by, it was a system that is imposed on racialized bodies by whiteness or white supremacy. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about discrimination, sure, sure. we can talk about violence, I'm not sure if, um, you can talk about black people being racist towards other yeah. black well, people. Yeah, I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with that that position, <clears throat> and I think there are there are different ways in which one can be racist. I mean, if you're in the position of hiring, obviously you can you can be racist in a way that's not the same as if you're a rank and file person. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, there's sometimes this is sort of a Tim Wise kind of comment. All right, that you know, you white black people can never be racist because. You have to have power to be racist, and white people have power. Therefore, white people can be racist, but black people can't. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I've I've lived in Newark for a long time. I lived in Newark for like ten years. I lived on the south side of Chicago, and I'm not to give trying to say credentials or anything, yeah. except to say that I've had a lot of different conversations with a lot of different folks over the years, and, and uh, there are plenty of of middle class or middle class aspiring black people who really think that. Poor black people are irresponsible, and I mean, actually, Obama said some things about poor black people, which I think were kind of racist. I think he said some things about Africans that were kind of racist. Okay, which isn't to say Obama just is a racist. I think that these these views are mixed in, in with anti-racism in a lot of people's minds, and certainly, um, you know, people from some people from the Caribbean. I I tend to have thought that black folks from the United States don't just don't have it together. I don't think those are the main forms of racism, right? But I think that we have to admit that it's, it, it functions very, in a very divisive and very powerful kind of way. And I think that it's, to use a fashionable word, taking agency away from black folks if you say that they can never be racist. Well, <laughs> you know that, what I'm I saying? Think that's not that yeah. they can't be discriminatory or yeah. other things. Yeah. I think it, within the context of colonialism, white supremacy, sure. um, you know, European epistemology that is well, what do you mean by European epistemology? Well, just that everything that, you know, when we look at education, academia, we're all, unless we're in spaces like this that are exposed to different epistemologies, mm -hmm. like Afro-epistemologies, uh, indigenous epistemologies, we're all based in a Eurocentric way. Marxism is one of them, postmodernism, post-structuralism. So, of course, we define this, these feelings we have towards others as only way we can as racist, whereas I, I think I would think about them in different ways, and I think a lot of people would think about them in, in different ways. Um, but you know, we, we can go back to yeah, that, right. I guess. Yeah. Um, my other comment was about, you know, I, I, you said that multiracial unity is criticized because of white people taking over, uh, but I think historically we've seen that in movements, um, whether feminism or um, others that white people do actually take over and the interests of white people are, you know, um, predominantly overrepresented. And so how, how do you, how do you qual qualify or contextualize for that? Like what, what would that look like for you, this multi -range? I'm really interested yeah, right, right, in, right, right, right. in yeah. that. What well, yeah, it's a question too of where, with all due respect, you get your information from when you say white people take over. I mean, I think, there have been all kinds of historical experiences, and that's part of the, the value, I think, in studying things like this, you know, the history of colonial America, or, you know, the, 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 the Many-Headed Hydra, that book that I mentioned about, you know, which has a whole chapter on the 1741 slave, multiracial re revolt against slavery. Uh, and in, in a way, it's almost as if some of the multiracial class struggle of the, of the working class is better than the theory <laughs> that has always accompanied it, right? But. Um, I, I take seriously the, the best things that the communist movement of the United, in the United States did in the 1930s and the 1940s, and it wasn't just a bunch of white people running things. I mean, if you talk about Scottsboro and if you talk about the kinds of things that were, Gerald Horn has a very interesting book about the Civil Rights Congress. Um, it's called, I think it was his first book. Maybe his first book was on Du Bois. I can't, he writes about a book a year. I don't know if you follow this <laughs> work. <laughs> But this one um, was called Communist Front, question mark, the Civil Rights Congress in the 1950s or something like that. And it's, it's just, it's an interesting detailing of the way that the, the CP, when it was 
you know, under, under siege with the Smith Act tiles and all of that and defending itself like crazy, every other case that it took, they had one for the Smith Act people, and some of whom were black, the most of whom were white, and then they would have these defense campaigns for Rosa Ingram and all of these black people who were under Willie McGee. And so all of that is, again, to say that if we study the history of these movements, I think that some of those negative presuppositions you might have would be dispelled, you see, and that's why I think that I'm just projecting. Why is it that a lot of left groups do not have vigorous chants like Asian, Latin, Black, and White, Workers of the World Unite, you know? You don't encounter that very often, and I think they're very good, and I think that those, those slogans are good, and so what is it that holds people back? And um, I think it's, again, you know, and it, to say that there's an indigenous epistemology and a black epistemology and a European epistemology and a white epistemology, I don't know, I don't, you don't buy it. I don't buy it. Okay. I, I, you know, I, that's the doctrine of incommensurability. I'm not saying that there aren't tendencies for people to have certain forms of groupthink, but to call them epistemologies is not, I would not go that far. But it's, it would be a good discussion. Yeah, for sure. And my last question is yes. more about this revolutionary reading that you talked about. Um, you know, when Trump came into power, nobody thought it would happen. And we up here didn't think it would happen. <laughs> and then he came into power. And then um, Doug Ford was running for premier, and we didn't think it was going to happen, and now it happened. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you see the future of America in the next election? Because I think it, it really um, <laughs> By America, you mean the United States. Okay. <laughs> it boils down, it, it comes, it floods over the, the border and, 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 and infests us for Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being a sarcastic. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean Trump, Trump is a disgusting excuse for a human being. Mm -hmm. but, but the people who oppose him are also <laughs> the ones in power. If, if Hillary Clinton had been elected, yeah. I, you know, I mean, she's never met a war she didn't like, you know. Um, no, but I'm, I'm serious. I'm not saying that they're the same. I think a, 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 a mistake that Marxists sometimes make, often make, is, oh, they're all the same. You know? No, the people in the ruling class have different kinds of strategies. But I, I made this kind of joke at the very beginning about who's lying the most these days. I mean, George Herbert Walker Bush, Desert Storm. Pig, remember the, the turkey hunt, going, going over the border and getting all of those people? I mean, he's a fascist, he's a racist, he's imperialist, and then this guy dies. And it's not, yeah. it's not just the conservative media, no. In fact, the NPR and PBS, they were just, oh, what a noble man and what a gentleman and what a this. And George W. Bush, who everybody hated, mm -hmm. you know, back at the beginning of the 2000s. Now he's all, he, because he at least act, he knows how to act presidential. <laughs> you know? So I'm not, I'm not dismissing what's behind your question, but I, I just think it's very, very important not to have the illusion that there's some wing of the ruling class that is substantially better than the other. And in fact, the main wing of the ruling class, in my opinion, in the United States is, is really detest Trump. And he's not really a member of the ruling class. He's a real estate mogul. He's got a few million dollars. He's not, he's not Morgan Stanley, you know. So he's not really one of them, and his craziness and his spontaneity and, I mean, you know, what, what he's trying to do now in I Iran and Iraq and get all the troops that are in Iraq to be spying on Iran. I mean, and the Pentagon is going nuts because now they're branding all of these Iranian groups as terrorists, and of course what can happen is then the, the, the American military can be branded as terrorists, and all of a sudden it's 52 pickup. So the guy is incredibly unstable and bad for U.S. imperialism. I think they'll find a way to get rid of him, you know. I, I, but he has this base of people whose xenophobia and racism and ph phenomenological <laughs> racism and all of that is just is supporting supporting him, you know. Yeah, it's, it's scary, but I think it's bad. No, why do, no matter what happens, we have to do our work because none of these guys are going to do anything good for us. That's my opinion. <laughs> Since you asked, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. It was very dense and it gave us uh, a well reasoned argument and a lot to think about. I just wonder if we can talk about a little bit of, like, you can talk.
talk a little bit about the moment of danger and instability that we're in right now. Yeah. Um, and so you've been coming out with, I think you mentioned Noel Ignatieff in some of your talks and, and a couple times, and he sort of switched his position on... Wait, who switched his position? Uh, Ignatieff. Uh, and, yeah, and yeah. switched his position from the role that racism, white supremacy plays in the uh, reproduction of capitalism. Mm -hmm. That a racialized capitalism may have been very, very well been a stage of capitalism, but we could be in a current stage of capitalism where contemporary branding, consumption practices, has to push back against racism, even if it's in a very superficial diversity uh -huh, uh -huh. framework. And I guess that leads me to my second question. Is there a possibility uh, with what we're seeing is that we could actually see an anti-capitalist politics align, align itself with white supremacy? Is that an op Is that something that is possible, given the period of instability we're in? You just mentioned right. that imperialism is getting rid of Trump because of what it forbids uh, yeah. contemporary global capitalism to achieve. Yeah. And is that our worst nightmare? Oh, we got a lot of bad nightmares out there. <laughs> um, I, I don't. Th so, what you, the, one of the questions there was: Could there be a racist anti-capitalism? I don't think so. I think that's a contradiction in terms. But I do think, and this is part of the, the support for Trump, which is complicated, right? Which is that a lot of, a lot of workers, who, many of whom identify with their whiteness, realize that in fact they quote unquote have been, as they say, left behind, terrible metaphor, like if we're all in this race and they've been left behind. But I mean, capitalism has been very bad for the working class in general, and it's been very bad for the white working class, okay? so. I mean, I think that some, there's an element of protest in the way that some of them have been fixated on Donald Trump as you know, somehow that's the force that's going to change things. But I, I, I think that there can, I think it's, a, I think it's an oxymoron of racist anti-capitalism. But I mean, in, in a sense, see, there are so many opportunities for us. You know, I told you this story about the guy with the, you know, the Iron Cross on his arm, right? He's a working class guy, right? And somebody got to him. You know, and let him started to make him see things a little bit differently. Okay, um, and there, there's some you know again the history of movements in the, in the United States. You know the populist movement. And C. Van Woodward wrote about this a long time ago. I'm not I'm not avoiding your question. All I'm saying is that if we study the way in which people with grievance with white people with class based grievances can be one away from seeing people of color as the enemy to seeing the system as the enemy. Um, but you were saying something about this kind of the, the Benetton-esque yeah. branding. I mean, where, where does that come in exactly? Well, the thing is, if you, if we have a theory of racialized capitalism. Yeah. I think the evidence is on so, I think we all so agree about that. Like, yeah. You know, capitalism doesn't exist without slavery. Yeah. But uh, capitalism is also a dynamic system. Right. It changes and adapts. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be as dependent on racialized mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. Over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm we're at a stage of capitalism where certainly even some sections of capital are threatened by racism mm -hmm. for different reasons. The ability to secure the best talent, uh, marketing and selling stuff in the markets. You could right. you know, go on. I, I still think it's very small. Right. Then what you're seeing is capitalism could potentially push towards an anti racist, as we currently discuss it, right. stage. It's, it's well, you know. Here's here's where we pull in our, our favorite thing called dialectical contradiction. <laughs> you know, because because capitalism needs a number of things. It needs to be non-racist enough in its in its in its political appearance that you can have a somewhat more multiracial ruling elite, which we do have. Okay. Now, you know, it's relatively minor, but there are a number of black folks who are CEOs. I mean, they're they're way up there, and that creates the impression that the, that the system is not racist, right? It, it, all of these notions of meritocracy feed into a certain kind of, it's not really anti-racism, but it's, you know, a, breaking down the apartheid nature of American racism. The apartheid nature of American racism is not going to, it's not been serving it too well, okay? So I think that there needs to be change in that way. Also, we don't know what the next military, large-scale military incursions are going to be in this country. I mean, Afghanistan's been going on forever, right? And we've been, at least 
brush fire wars, which are, of course, not just brush fires for the people who are on the ground there. Um, but you know, if the, if the United States military needs to undertake a major attempt to confront some power or group of powers, they're going to need to have a multiracial army, right? So they're going to have to have a certain kind of propaganda that makes that, you know, Band of Brothers kind of stuff really desirable. At the same time, though, global capitalism, global, I mean, if you read, there's a wonderful book by John Smith called Imperialism in the 21st Century. I don't know if you've read it. It's economically a little bit intricate, but it's, it, it just talks about the dynamics of this whole North versus South stuff. And on the one hand, it shows that there are class divisions right within the global North and within the global South. It's not just one versus the other. But on the other hand, who are the most super exploited workers yielding immense amounts of surplus value in the world? And there are huge numbers of them in Indonesia and Bangladesh and South Africa and south of the American border. And capitalism needs that kind of racism, which is often a gendered racism, too. I mean, the, the, the most oppressed workers in the entire world are brown-skinned young women in Bangladesh or something. I don't know. I mean, who's, who's doing the oppression Olympics? But um, so I think capitalism needs both. And, 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 it'll, and they, they work overtime. And they have business schools and everything, figuring out how to do all of this. <laughs> say something else? If there's a yeah, first time question. Yeah, okay, so. But I guess this is going to be my second okay, time. Okay, that's okay. Will somebody okay. else? Have, yeah. No, because again, I just find this conversation super generative. Again, thinking of organizing, etc. And I do sometimes feel like having been and am a part of you know many Marxist groups uh, and socialists, mm -hmm. I sometimes feel like we're more focusing on, and I wonder how much yeah, we more, ourselves... More focusing on what? I'm, sorry. I'm gonna tell you in a oh, second. <laughs> no, I, I've just changed the train of my thought, because I feel like sometimes we do also buy into the very things that we criticize, such as, for instance, like intersectionalities this and that, and the point that I'm gonna make is that I feel like we're more focused on somehow saving, organizing, revolutionizing the white working class than seeing, you know, like Muslim, black, and other people of color communities also as a part of uh, working class communities to be organized. You know, I think like lots of, you know, Jacobin, and that's the, you know, the editor guy has gone completely, I mean, Assad Haidar himself, yeah. they have gone completely, you know, over the board about, oh, how could we organize the white working class? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really think that that's a problem. I mean, first of all, they have never emailed us saying that I'd like to be organized, would you please come? Second is that we do have people who are immediately the recipient of violence. Yeah. And then why do we not work with also see them as yeah. organizable as opposed to thinking that they are cultural separatist entities and we should not necessarily engage with them? Because, you know, I mean, these statistics are useful, statistics yeah. that you were quoting, that yes, the 50% that were killed are white people. Mm -hmm. But I think, I'm not sure if that's a very convincing argument to say that, oh, you know, like as a white person, you have a very, you know, good chance right, of being right, killed. Because right. I'm not sure that's how it is being experienced, right? right? Like when you walk, or I mean, like, think of the New Zealand, right? Like, the, mm -hmm. the massacre right. that just happened. Right. I mean, like, you're a Muslim person going into the mosque. Uh, you do have a different feeling than, you know, a white person, even yeah. though statistically right. could be higher. Like, right. I think we also need to start, you know, yeah, thinking yeah. of these people not as communities, but also as our communities of working class. Right. That also needs to be yeah. organized. Yeah. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. And I would say t two comments to that. I mean, I think that actually, you know, the. The, the cutting edge of, of fascist recruitment of significant sections of the working class in this country might well take a, a kind of form of a racialized religious bigotry, bigotry mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of all kinds of suggestions of that. And I think that you know, um, you know, I didn't take your comment as you know a, a direct criticism of me, no, but no. but it is. I mean, I would have told you. No, but no, <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, because you know, I mean, I remember when I was starting to talk about the Afro pessimists, and I was sort of saying that. You know, my, my personal experience and what it is that I've chosen to study as a scholar for so many years now um, really has focused around anti-black racism. And, the, and, and therefore, I think, it's a, I think it's a fault, right, that to, to see the question of racism too often in terms of a black-white binary. 
And people often say, well, yeah, I know, and we really need to be talking about Native Americans and indigenous and Hispanics, but let's just really get down to the, like, the, the nitty gritty as black versus white. Um, so I think you're right, okay? Um, the only thing I would say is that the way in which that struggle needs to be carried forward is not through some sort of, you know, rainbow liberal pluralism or something mm -hmm. like that, you know. Um, and if we see what happened in New Zealand, you know, yes. You know. And yet it's interesting that the same time as that horrible stuff happened in New Zealand, was it in Botswana? Thousands of, a thousand people have just died because of some typhoon that came through or, you know, and again, that's in the New York Times, you know, page six down in the corner there. You know, and there's, there's a way in which black lives are still seen as so cheap, you know, which is not to negate the point that you're making at all. You know, yes, we have to be very creative and very committed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so thanks for your uh, talk. And um, yeah, the, the discussion gives me a lot of food for thoughts. But I also want to change the discussion, the direction of discussion a little bit sure. to a different uh, direction. So. Uh, as you may be very aware, um, the Marxists in general have been criticized for being racist or sexist. Like they haven't been incorporating the race analysis or gender analysis or other um, identity issues into their um, worldview, right? So they're. I mean, like it's a very sometimes um, you know, like there have been a lot of debates about the nature of Marxism and its dialectical scope and etc. Mm -hmm. But that's why a lot of anti-racist groups or feminist group have been refusing to work with leftist people or Marxist activists. Um, so I wonder. And you studied a lot of uh, uh, the history um, of the relationship between capitalism and racism, racist mm -hmm. structure. So then, what would be the sort of vision of Marxism, or Marxist politics, or leftist politics mm -hmm. for liberation and emancipation? Like, what what kind of uh, the notion of totality should Marxists have in order to explain and fight against not only ca uh, capitalism but also racism, sexism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and other oppressive structures? Like, what kind of vision would you suggest that we have to have to form a wider coalition, um, both whites and black and browns and yellow, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. what kind of notion of universal, what totality should we have? That's a big question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, okay. The first thing I'm going to say is going to sound very orthodox, okay? Um, because I, I think that the reason that these varying oppressions exist, which seem to be non-class oppressions, okay, or are more mediated. Okay, um, they all ultimately derive directly or indirectly from the extraction of surplus from laboring populations. I think that's the reason why people suffer. Everybody. Okay. Now, if you're a woman in a certain situation, you are inserted into that in a particular kind of way. And if we don't understand the mediations that connect her experience, maybe she's, you know, a mother who's continually get being gotten pregnant or something like that, okay, because of a <clears throat> of an ethos in, in her culture that, that that's who she is, okay. Well, what she's mainly doing is, is supplying labor for the people who run the society. I'm not sure that this is the best way of getting at it. Let me, let me, let me back up a bit. Um, I think the, the, the key thing to see is that, that oppression exists because exploitation exists. We don't have to understand the particularities of the oppressions, but uh, it's, it's sort of like having a unified field theory, because otherwise what you have is that white supremacy causes racism, right, and male dominance causes sexism, 
and heteronormativity causes homophobia. Well, I think that's probably true, but I think hetero heteronormativity is a mediation of sexism in various kinds of ways, sexual dualism. But I mean, I think that if we have a kind of map of how all of these things connect to each other, then the kind of work that needs to be done to extend Marxism in a way that maintains its dialectical and materialist core, then that can be done, okay? And um, I, I, I went through it very briefly, okay, in my talk, but in, in terms of talking about race and class, there's a, there's, a, there's a pretty honorable Marxist tradition at this point of people who have honorable, it's a sort of feudalistic way of putting it, <laughs> but of, of people who have thought through and thought past the limitations of Marx's and Engels' writing on that. But I, don't think the, I don't think the limitations are profound in that if you go through everything that Marx and Engels have written, you see that there's a deep understanding of the role of the centrality of colonialism, right, to the, the growth of capitalism, the centrality of racism to colonialism, though they don't use racism in quite the same way that we do. Um, the way that they looked to rebels against colonialism, whether it's a sepoy mutiny, a mutiny or the, the, the slaves who were rising up in the, in the American Civil War, the, the way that they you know, saw sort of Spartacus type figures leading those movements as being valuable, all of that is there. But uh, I mentioned in passing um, Nikhil Pal Singh, if I'm getting his name right, S-I-N-G-H, who has an article in that Futures of Black Radicalism book that's named after or in, in the tradition of Robinson. And he makes a very good set of points acknowledging the ways in which Marx and Engels saw all this stuff and yet basically saying that he, ta he talks about it as so-called primitive accumulation, meaning mainly they were talking about the genesis of the capitalist mode of production but not really talking a lot about the ongoing way in which hegemony, the hard work of hegemony is maintained by capitalists who have a direct interest in racism every moment of the day. So that, that you know, the kind of work that Singh is calling for, the kind of work that Ted Allen has done is, is really important in extending that methodology and showing its implications. Now in terms of the gender questions, um, uh, when I, I published this piece in, on intersectionality in science and society a little while ago, I don't know if you saw the whole symposium, but uh, Lisa Vogel, Marta Jimenez, and uh, Hester Eisenstein, who I think are super smart Marxist feminists, um, they had a lot to say, okay? I mean, you know, Martha, Martha Jimenez, uh, maybe she's, I don't know, they're all good. They're all good in various kinds of ways, but you know, they, they talk about the class contradiction as primary, not in the sense that workers are more important than women, though of course women are often workers, it's a matter of a mode of explanation. See, and very often the mode of explanation is seen to correspond to identities. And if the, and if the mode of explanation is talking about the working class and then encoded into that, oh, we're really talking about the white working class, then you're saying white workers matter more than brown-skinned women, which is not the point of the analysis. The point is it's, a, it's an expl explanatory priority, okay? But it doesn't mean, and I, as I said very briefly in my, in my talk, um, you know, very often, if you want to talk just about suffering, you know, the people who have suffered at the hands of capitalism over the last five or six hundred years, well, a lot of people have suffered, but it hasn't been mainly white workers, though if you read Engels on Manchester, it's pretty damn bad. Um, but, you know, the people, you know, wherever, wherever there has been suffering of a white European-bred working class, what's ever gone on in the rest of the world, the colonized world, the brown and black world, has always been worse. Okay, so I'm not sure I'm, I'm getting the, the concepts you need to, to answer the question, it's, but it's not one versus the other, that's all. And, and, and Marxism is not racist. Marxism is not sexist, okay? It's not. It's a methodology for understanding the sources of exploitation in the world and the way, and then what we need to do is to have as rich and robust and variegated a discourse as possible with all kinds of research like the people like you guys in this room are going to be doing right or are already doing to you know show the multiple mediations connecting gendered experiences with but to me I'm yeah I'm a I, I view the causality as fundamentally in in, in class exploitation class-based exploitation that's that's what drives it something else doesn't drive it that's what drives it that was a long-winded response. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah.